Yeah, so I'm going to talk about jQuery Mobile and PhoneGap. I'm Corey. Uh, you can, I think, find the slides on that link. Uh, and we'll just get started. I'm going to start off talking a little bit about myself. I work at a company called HealthX in Indiana, which is a great state. Uh, not as rainy, but still awesome. Uh, so we have a jQuery Mobile and PhoneGap app. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I've contributed some to some open source projects. Um, Recently, I've been working on a couple books, I'm working on this jQuery mobile cookbook, which is a collaborative effort led by the guys that append to, uh, and it's, uh, it's going to be awesome. And I just got somebody, a new follower. Isn't that great? Uh, cool. And I'm working on a node book that should be out sometime this fall. Uh, look at this. This is awesome. I love you, Windows 8. Uh, Anyway, so let's get about, talk about this talk, and we'll also monitor how many followers I get throughout the process. Uh, so this is, like I said, it's going to be a talk about jQuery Mobile and PhoneGap and kind of how it worked for us at HealthX. So it's kind of a grab bag of a lot of things. We're going to talk about just integrating the native device features with PhoneGap, so getting more than just the web view out of it. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the plugin ecosystem, uh, particularly push notifications, which are um, Pretty cool, and uh, it's nice to be able to access the, uh, have access to those as a web developer. Uh, we're also going to talk about one of the hardest things, maybe in remote or, or in mobile uh, development, is remote debugging. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that, uh, and, and then we're going to take a look at yes, another follower, uh, some of my questionable Objective C code. Uh, so that'll be fun. Watch out. So let's talk a little bit about why you would target natives. Um, well, business needs are big, right? Uh, a lot of businesses need to, or would like to have uh, like this little icon in your pocket. And so that's big and valuable to a lot of companies. So that's a, a big reason. Another reason is you can make money uh, in the native stores. And that's not as easy to do as a web developer uh, every time they download your site on uh, you know, Firefox or Chrome, even though there is a Chrome web store and things. Uh, the native devices are, are pretty good for that, so that's another reason. And then like I alluded to, uh, the device features that you can have with PhoneGap, uh, more than just a wrapped web application, you can actually t talk to the accelerometer and things. Uh, although a lot of the modern browsers do that, some of the old ones don't on mobile, so that's a good reason to target mobile. Uh, also, we're a small team, so a small team of web developers can create a mobile device with PhoneGap or a mobile app with PhoneGap. And we don't have to have separate teams that are concentrating only on iOS, and only on Android, and only on BlackBerry, and only on Windows. So that's another bonus, uh, which some of you may or may not know. Uh, so let's move on to jQuery Mobile and PhoneGap. But first, uh, how many people have a native app or a PhoneGap app? Couple, cool, right on. How many target more than one platform? Cool, yeah. Uh, so, and it's so PhoneGap, we use that. Um, let's just take a quick survey of what PhoneGap does. And it allows you to write in, you know, JavaScript, CSS, and HTML, even jQuery. <laughs> Another follower. That's great. Uh, and then PhoneGap will bridge these native device features for you. Uh, and it's, it's going to expose them in your JavaScript, so you're able to access those uh, very easily. Um, you can also easily implement native features in your web app. Uh, so uh, like, because of the bridge, you can do that. Uh, and also the push notifications that can come in uh, with plugins. Uh, so what is the future of PhoneGap, though? The future of PhoneGap is it becomes uh, less relevant or, or almost irrelevant. PhoneGap is really helping to drive the mobile web forward. And more and more mobile web browsers are getting the capabilities that PhoneGap already has. So someday, it may not need to be around. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, so why jQuery Mobile? Um, Ralph talked a lot about this this morning. Um, so I'm just going to kind of touch on it briefly. Uh, first of all, for us, we're a big jQuery shop. And I'm sure a lot of you guys are too. Uh, so it's comfortable to use jQuery Mobile because the ecosystem and the community is just as good with jQuery Mobile as it is with jQuery. So that's one good reason to do it. 
And also, he showed you some of the graded browser support, and the cross-platform support is just incredible. Uh, so here's a, a look of that uh, at the grade A support. I don't know if you can see all that, but um, you know, if you're wanting to run your jQuery mobile stuff in Windows XP on Internet Explorer 8, you can. Uh, and a lot of other mobile frameworks can't do that. So that's one of the reasons why, if you're wanting to build more than just a wrapped app, but one that can also be accessible from desktop and uh, the web, why I think jQuery mobile is great. Um, another big thing is it's easy to write. And he showed you an example of that with, or Ralph did, uh, with just the template of a page. Um, but this is just so if you just want to build a list view, it's easy, right? It's just a normal list view. And you could style it with CSS and stuff. But just telling it in jQuery mobile that it is a list view, it's going to behave as expected across all of those different devices. So it makes that easier. Um, <clears throat> another thing that he talked about were the custom themes. So I'm kind of reiterating everything he said. Uh, the theme roller is incredible. So you can build anything to fit your brand. So you can have something that's nice and pretty like this or something that is absolutely horrifying. So don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but you could. Don't do it. Uh, and then there's some other themes that you can find on GitHub and things. So flat UI, he mentioned about that kind of the way jQuery Mobile is going. But there's already some out there. This is a little snippet from one. And uh, I'll have to put the link up later to this repository. But it's, you know, it's, it's just a different look and feel for the same jQuery Mobile. Uh, also, BlackBerry 10, uh, they have their own theme so that if you want to build a BlackBerry 10 app that has the same look and feel of their native, just use their theme, and it's going to be the same experience for your users. So uh, they also built custom widgets. Uh, I think the drop down was a little different on BlackBerry. So to make it match the native, they have a custom widget in there. And so they extend the widget factory just like jQuery mobile team and jQuery UI team and make it great. So speaking of widgets, the widget factory is one of my favorite things to use. Um, it's really helped in our development. Uh, and like we talked about earlier, uh, jQuery UI, jQuery mobile, they, they both use it. Um, we use it. Everybody should use it. Blackberry uses it. Uh, it's easy extended. It keeps your plugins neat. Uh, so I like that. So at HealthX, we have this content delivery system, basically, where if you have a new claim that is paid to you or something, and we notify the user we want to have like this card. But we want it to not only be available as you're notified on your mobile device, but also on the desktop. So build one widget uh, that works for both our pages that are on mobile, that are low jQuery mobile, and also on jQuery UI um, that use the jQuery UI widget factory. Uh, so you can build one set of markup and then run that through the one widget factor or the one widget instance, uh, whether it's on desktop or mobile. And so on mobile, your card will render uh, like that, or you can drop it into the grid on the desktop, and it, it renders differently. So there's one set of code, uh, one set of markup, and it's shared across both the native or the desktop platform and the, and the mobile platform. So that's cool. I'm getting all sorts of followers. Um, so let's talk about now, like not just an overview of PhoneGap and jQuery Mobile, but actually integrating native device features. Uh, a lot of this stuff you can get off the docs, so I'm not going to go into like a strict tutorial of how to do this. Um, but if you to to integrate, you got to go through these steps basically. You got to download PhoneGap, so you can do that from PhoneGap.com. And phone, so PhoneGap, I should I should make this clear. PhoneGap is the Adobe version of Apache Cordova. Uh, so I use PhoneGap when I talk, but it's, uh, it could be, I could be saying Cordova as well. So download PhoneGap from PhoneGap.com, or you can download it from Cordova.io. Uh, so once you've downloaded it, you go through the docs, and you can, like, on iOS, you run a, a shell script uh, that, like, you can set, it sets up your whole project for you, and, uh, like, an Xcode template, and you open it up. Uh, Anyway, follow the docs. And then once you get uh, your application up and running, you just need to include this Cordova.js in your source. And that's going to create that bridge. And so you just sit back, and you're good to go. Uh, 
So that's just going to really build you nothing. So you need to actually integrate the features. So let's talk about if you were going to do a camera and then upload the image to a server. Um, first thing that you're going to do is you're going to look to make sure that your device is ready. So PhoneGap emits a device ready event saying, hey, I'm ready. And then you need to check and make sure you actually do have access to the camera. And then from there, um, you need to set some options. So in this situation, we're going to uh, have a destination of this file URI, and we're going to have a JPEG encoding, uh, and we're going to pull it from the camera only. You could also pull it from the gallery of your phone. Uh, anyway, we just chose to do camera. Uh, <clears throat> so then you're going to pass that into this get picture function. Uh, and this is going to have the success callback. And the success callback is going to actually have the file URI of that image you just took on your device. Uh, that's what, within that is where you're going to probably want to grab that file and upload it to your server. So for that, we use file upload. And this is uh, also through PhoneGap. You can grab uh, that file by passing in the image URI that you got from, from your callback, your success callback. Uh, you've also got some options that you set, right? So you want to match your MIME type to the type of file that you just created, so JPEG here in this case. Uh, and then you upload it to your, to your URL of your, of your server. So that's, that's it. You've got native device features in your web app on your mobile device. So that's, that's pretty good, pretty cool. There's all sorts of other features, though, that you have uh, that you can hit. But so this is what it would look like in jQuery Mobile. This is a, like a snapshot of what happens after I've attached a picture to this message. Uh, it's it's auto-saved to camera snapshot. But you can edit the file name. You can rename it, delete it, or submit it up to the servers at that point in time. So uh, that's, that's how that integrates uh, on your mobile device. Here's just a list of all of the features that you have right now in uh, the current version of PhoneGap, uh, which is 2.5, maybe. Anyway, um, and they, they have a very good rapid release cycle that keeps adding new features and, and doing things as well. So let's talk about push notifications. This is a little bit more involved uh, because you kind of have to deal with these secure ways to talk to uh, the different platforms and to your plugin. So, but uh, push notifications, there are several services or plugins that you can use with PhoneGap that do it. Two, two that I've used, uh, Push Push, which is a pretty awesome name, and also Urban Airship. I currently use Urban Airship. Uh, I'm not going to debate which one's better. I, I like Urban Airship because of the API, but they're both, I think, decent. So what do you have to do to actually prepare your device for push notifications or your application to push to devices? Uh, so you need to enable it for the platforms, like I alluded to. Uh, you need to link uh, that pushable app <laughs> to Urban Airship so that Urban Airship knows that you've got an app. And then you need to get the plugin into your uh, phone gap source. And then you need to get that push code into the jQuery mobile app. So enabling that for your platform. Uh, like I say, it can be involved, not difficult. Also got to talk to all your vendors. Uh, so they send, like Apple has this secure key and you have to go and enable an app. Uh, and then you get that, and you import that to Urban Airship. And Google, you get a, uh, like an ID that you pass in to Urban Airship as well. Uh, but, so you just the platform has to know that you want to push, because they're not just going to push anything. Uh, so then you integrate that into your pro project. We're going to talk about iOS and Android um, today. The big thing you need to do is get these plug-in classes into your project. And this is an Xcode. Uh, this push notification plugin is the main bridge that does all of the heavy lifting. And the app delegate surrogate is just going to talk to your app uh, so that you can access those push features. Um, you need to update a few settings. So you need to tell PhoneGap uh, th that it has reference to these new classes. You need to whitelist urbanairship.com so that you can actually receive that in your phone in your native app. Um, add a couple libraries and make sure that they compile 
uh, as well as their key and secret for urban airship. Uh, if, if you don't add the libraries, Xcode gets very angry. Um, so there's a few gotchas. Uh, one thing is talking development versus production. Um, even if you're in a testing environment, but you have like a, a spread out testing team, or we use a, um, we use, anyway. So if you're dev only, you can use this development push server and it's free on Urban Airship, right? It's absolutely free tier. If you're on the production, it's not free, but you still get a million pushes free or whatever. So you're probably safe if you're in testing. Uh, so we use test flight for our distributed testing teams. And uh, we can't just use a dev for that. We have to use an ad, ad hoc build. So we have to use the production servers even on our testing. Uh, it's just a gotcha because Urban Airship's not probably gonna tell you that there was an error. It's just gonna not send these messages. So if you're gonna be doing this, just it'll save you a couple hours of why isn't my push going there? Um, so there, there, that's a gotcha. Android is similar. You gotta include this Urban Airship executable, some plugins, uh, same sort of push notification plugin that's doing a lot of the heavy lifting. And then this intent receiver because of the Android intents, uh, it's gonna tell you that you wanted to receive a push. Uh, also, you need to update your configurations, and then you're actually into talking about initializing the code in your Java. Um, it's, it's, I think it's kind of cute that Urban Airship is not like a start, it's a takeoff and a landing. Uh, so I thought I would include that slide because I thought it was neat. Um, and then you also, there's another class that you have to add uh, this, like these analytics things to. So then you need to use this in your jQuery mobile application, right? So you have to, just like you included that Cordova JS file uh, for the phone gap bridge, you have this push notification JS file that bridges the native to your app. Uh, so then we actually register for pushes. This is inside your device ready. You've got access to these push notifications. You're gonna register for these types. So you can have any of these bits, right? You can do just alerts. You can do the little red badge thingy. Uh, you can do sound and all that. And then you register for that event once you've registered. And this is gonna create your segments for you. Uh, so we do this with by user and site. Uh, you can set your tags for an array. So you could split up your users into any segment that you want. Um, but that's just an example. Then you need to enable this push notification. Uh, and to do that, you just call enable push. And there you go. Uh, and then also there's this check if it is enabled. So we're gonna recheck and reset that alias uh, so that whoever's got that enabled push on their device is the user that signed in. Because uh, we don't, you know, we wanna keep that, that alias up to date. So you push uh, and this this is through the API. You can curl it, uh, or we use just a web request to send it. Uh, but it's a very straightforward API and uh, very, very easy to use. So that's how you push. Uh, let's talk about remote debugging, uh, which is it's it makes it kind of makes me stabby sometimes because it's not fun at times. Uh, so there's some methods that aren't very good to do remote debugging. Uh, we all have probably done that. Yeah, here I am in the code. Uh, then there's also Xcode console. So if you've got a Mac and an iPad hooked up and you're trying to debug, uh, you can go into this Xcode console of that device and it's got all sorts of junk output. And then you might be able to find some sort of console log statement in there and uh, a new follower. Uh, anyway, so that's a mess. Uh, also, Logcat. When, if, an, if you're an Android, it's same sort of situation. Uh, it's, you can filter on it a little bit better, but you still have to kind of sift through all sorts of information and it's not the best method. Uh, so, but before you get to your native device, you can do a lot of remote debugging with modern browsers. So uh, Opera Dragonfly on the old Opera uh, used to be really uh, sweet. You just basically give it a port you're gonna listen to, and then on your phone, you pull it up on Opera Mobile and listen on that same port. You don't even have to connect it to your device. Um, but so now they've moved to Chromium, so it's the dev tools and it's 
almost an exact mirror of the Chrome remote debugging, which is still really good, but you do have to tether it. So, uh, and also Firefox, the new dev tools that they have have been working on, they're really uh, doing a good job with trying to progress their capabilities there as well. So Opera, got to enable it on your device. So this is just, I'm talking Android here. Um, you're going to enable remote debugging on your device. And then you're going to navigate to Opera Debug. And then it's going to ask you, do you really want to enable remote debugging? And you are like, yes, Opera. I wouldn't have gone to Opera colon debug if I wasn't. But anyway, um, once you've plugged in your device, you forward the port. And then you say, I want to do Opera Dev Tools Remote. And then in a Chromium-based browser, you navigate to that and debug. Opera, or for Chrome, is the same story, only you just switch Opera and Chrome, basically. Uh, instead of going to Chrome debug, you just enable it in the settings. Um, also, you ADB forward, and then you navigate to a Chromium-based browser and debug. Firefox is an, another similar story. Uh, you enable remote debugging on your device. Uh, you go to about config, and this is where it gets a little bit different. Uh, they may clean this up. Uh, I kind of hope they do, because it's kind of a mess. You've got to find devtools.debugger.forcelocal. You've got to set that to false. Then devtools.debugger.remote-enabled, and you've got to set that to true. Then you need to forward your port once you've plugged in. Uh, and then you go to connect in the web developer tools. Uh, so this is assuming you've already enabled remote debugging in your, web in your, in your, new, in your DevTools console. Uh, and then you just connect. And it's just that easy. Uh, so if you are on a web view, if you're already on a device, you're not going to be able to use Chrome or Opera or Firefox. So you can do something like JS console, which so you include this script here in your site temporarily. Don't leave it in there during production. And then you go into jsconsole.com. You type listen. And you can also pass in like a key. So you could do like listen cheese, and then make sure that you put cheese at the end of your URL in your script on your device. And then you can send like, then you get access to the console on the remote device. So uh, here is like just a snippet of what happened when I sent a remote command, which was like alert, which is an awesome remote command to send. Uh, but so that's a kind of a really quick way to get access to the console on a remote device if you're in a web view and you're not using a modern browser. Uh, but then there's this whole other class of remote debugging, which is kind of, I guess, maybe the top of the game right now. And this is Winery uh, Web Inspector Remote. Uh, it runs many remote debuggers. So the, the remote feature, which I think is st still experimental on JS Fiddle, Trigger I.O., which is another native wrapping experience, has a remote debugger that's powered by Winery. Adobe Edge Inspect, uh, powered by Winery. Debug.phonegap.com is powered by Winery. It's also installable locally. Uh, you just do npm install uh, dash g for global uh, Winery, and then you have access to it. So once you have access to it locally, so you can just tell in your command prompt that you want to do Winery. And then you uh, open up your browser to where that's at. Yeah, you can get the client URL for inspecting and then enjoy. You can also inject it in. So I'm going to try to show you briefly how this works, uh, if we can. So I'm going to open up Opera over here. I don't have Winery running yet. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to go Winery. Get it going. Hey, we're running. OK, so here we are. We don't have any targets. We don't have anything to debug. Uh, so I'm going to inject that script uh, for debugging into my thing. Here we go. We go into the console over here, and we're in. Uh, so that's cool. You can remote debug. Uh, so you could do, like, I'm going to look at my slide, and that's And then slide, we're going to do a background color of hot pink, because that's what I wanted to do. 
Right? So you could do that if you have a, a remote device, too. This doesn't have to be just another browser in your, in your window, but you can have this running and you can change it all. So that is very powerful, and um, it's a great tool. You should definitely use it. All right, let's get back over here. Pink. All right. So this is kind of an interesting thing. iOS doesn't have a back button, as many of us know. And in the web view, if you don't have a back button, you're just trapped. And a lot of users really don't like that for some reason. Um, so URLs can become a problem. If, if we use a CMS, so we kind of give a lot of people freedom in their applications to link to their own content. So if they link to some sort of a PDF or a giant image that doesn't have the jQuery mobile back button in the app anymore because they've left and they're in iOS, they get trapped. It's no fun. Uh, so there's ways to control this. Uh, Cordova has this external host file, so you can tell it what what URLs you want to open in the web view, and everything else will just open in Safari. Um, so you can put them all in there, like each URL.com. Uh, you can do wildcards. It's like an asterisk. The problem with that is then, you can, then everything is in the web view, and you get trapped. Um, so then you might have to add some code. Uh, so you could say, don't open these URLs in your code. So you just kind of move it to a different place. Uh, in our situation, we have these. Uh, encrypted URLs, so we can't whitelist them, so we have to use an asterisk. Uh, so we have to use the code solution. So here's this Objective-C. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Uh, this is a function inside of PhoneGap that says, I should start loading in the web view. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for this fragment on the URL. So we're going to tell our users to put in open external equals true fragment on each of their URLs so that it'll open in Safari on iOS. So that's exactly what we're going to do. But our, your, our you know, users don't want to have to remember that. I don't want to have to remember that. So there's another trick uh, that you can do to allow that to happen. So we're going to bind all of our clicks, and we're going to put that hash on anything that has the target equals blank. Uh, so that's just kind of a little trick that you can do um, to not trap your users. Uh, and that is pretty much all I have to talk about. Do you guys have any questions? Yeah. I have an application running HTML jQuery, uh -huh. and then do data service service to pull the data from a database. So can I do phone gap to uh, touch my application and move it to mobile and so, connect to the data service? Yeah. So the question is, can you use PhoneGap to uh, create a, a mobile app for an HTML and jQuery app that pulls in data? Absolutely. You just have to tell PhoneGap what URL you are using, or you can just do a remote, uh, like a remote API call to get that data. And, and yeah, absolutely. Can you elaborate? I, I kind of missed it. Were you talking about the urban airship and using it with test flight and a dev mode? OK. Work, or so it, it's a limitation somewhere. So the question is, why do you have to switch from dev mode to production mode with urban airship uh, and iOS? particular. Uh, and that's because I think it's a limitation in Apple when you're using ad hoc mode for de deployment. Uh, they, then you have to push through the uh, production servers, I believe. Okay. Anything else? No? Thank you very awesome. much. Awesome. Thanks.